Good evening and welcome to Doctors on Call. Tonight we're answering your questions on how to best take care of your loved ones as they age. I'm your host, Dr. Ray Christensen from the Department of Family Medicine and Behavioral Health at the University of Minnesota Medical School in Duluth. I'm pleased to welcome our panelists tonight, Dr. Mark Boyce, a geriatric and elder care specialist with Essentia Health in Duluth, Dr. Jeff Kauf Koopman, a family physician with Fairview Masaba Clinics in Hibbing, and Dr. Mac Michael Van Scoy, a geriatric elder care specialist with Essentia Health. It's time to call in your questions locally at 218-788-2844 or toll free at 1-877-307-8762. Those numbers will be floating across the bottom of your screen. Our medical students answering the phones tonight are Michael Bergdorf, from Buffalo, Minnesota, Nick Reiners from Cambridge, Minnesota, and Eric Swen Erica Swenson from Brainerd, Minnesota. And now on to tonight's program. Last week was the last uh, evening that Dr. Alan Johns is going to host this program. Alan is stepping off into retirement to spend time with his family and grandchildren. And I want to thank him very much from the University of Minnesota and for myself for the work that he's done, not only for this program over the many years that he's hosted it, but I've known Alan for a long, long time. Uh, his work here in Northeast Minnesota with uh, Duluth Clinic and e eventually Essentia and the work at the medical school has helped not only his many, many patients, but it's really been beneficial. He's dearly loved by our medical students and the mark that he's left uh, with them and also with hosting this program is indelible. So J Alan, thank you. You're joining Ruth. I'm gonna miss both of you next year. Um, Dr. Van Scoy. You want to tell us a little bit about your practice, please? Sure. Um, yeah, I joined uh, the Duluth Clinic, which is now Essentia Health, uh, back in 94, so I've been here for 24 years. Um, I am uh, board certified in internal medicine and um, a hospice and palliative care, uh, like my colleagues here, and um, I also am a certified medical director uh, for the American Association of Post-Acute and Long-Term Care. Um, so my practice is uh, um, with Dr. Boyce in the long-term care and post-acute care facilities with folks who need help um, <clears throat> as a resident of a skilled nursing home or folks that are just recovering from a hospital stay. Then the other part of my job is I'm a medical director for care coordination programs where I work with about 35 RNs and we develop care plans for elders that are living at home and the goal is to maintain independence as long as safely possible, and then to make the transitions to more uh, supportive environments as smooth as possible. Very good. Thank you. Dr. Coltman. I practice at uh, Fairview Range in Hibbing. I've been there for 25 years now. Um, my primary uh, specialty was family practice, but as my career's changed, I've become board certified in hospice and palliative medicine. And uh, right now I spend about 50% of my time doing primary care and 50% of my time uh, doing that. Um, like Dr. Van Scoy, I'm the medical director for several facilities out there um, and do um, a fair amount of palliative care consults. Dr. Boyce? Well, I entered from a family medicine tract and I was doing uh, full scope family medicine for many years in Hermantown and then the opportunity to join uh, Dr. Van Scoy in the initially uh, uh, post-acute and long-term care and now what's morphed into also seeing folks in their home in assisted living uh, and uh, we don't actually know where the boundaries of where we need to be in the future maybe hospital in the home and other sorts of palliative programs. We were talking a little bit about that uh, earlier, about the, the directions that we will be going in the future to again have that idea of keeping folks in their home that is essentially the least expensive place to age uh, and versus when you need to be more into a facility for uh, whether it's dementia and you're wandering or uh, maybe you're just too frail to uh, be doing your own cares in your own home. So the hospice, do you want to just tell us what hospice is? Uh, explain that. Uh, sure, Jeff, I can do, you want that. To do that. Yeah, one of the questions that we get quite often is what is it you've, you, uh, the term between palliative care and hospice? Yes. And, and, and basically um, the difference is, is that palliative care um, is specialized primarily in symptom control and in chronic disease. Um, we as physicians are trained as fix-it kind of people. 
Um, sometimes it's very frustrating um, knowing that there's people have diseases that you can't fix. That's where we come in. We know that people have chronic illnesses. We focus on symptom control and making what time they have uh, in their life um, the best that we can. Now the difference between palliative care and hospice, hospice basically is that last six months of life where we know that the patient is terminal. We focus primarily on not, uh, not disease directed therapy, but primarily in symptom control. So palliative care, we usually start two to three years uh, in patients with chronic illness. Hospice is usually that last six months of life. So I'll offer myself up a little bit to all three of you at this point because I'm into that age where I need to think about some of those things. So I'll show up, I'll come out to your office, Dr. Copeman. I'm an old rural guy, uh, old farm kid. Uh, what kind of things, when I come into your office uh, as a 70 plus year old person, what's important when I come in for that visit? When you so let's just start there and kind of walk it through a little bit. Sure, the first thing um, is that I always look at cancer screening. Um, that's so important, especially as we age. A lot of the t uh, malignancies that we see uh, become more frequent as we age. Um, the second thing that I always will address will be um, cardiovascular screening, those kind of things to try to maximize where we are at your life. The last part of our visit though is spent on um, life goals, um, activities, uh, things that, uh, you know, family life, those things that we um, use to, to, how do I say, get a better picture of you and try to maintain your health as best that we can. Mark? It's really interesting. Uh, some studies have shown that the actual medical care, me writing a prescription of Lasix for uh, diuretic, uh, is, is a small portion of your health. Mm -hmm. And so my prescription writing or that part of it is only about 10% of the value of your future health. 10% is who you came from, your genetics. 40% mm -hmm. is actually your station in life. Do you have poverty? Are you well enough mm -hmm. to afford things? And then about 40% is the choices you make. Are you having Chinese, as I write the prescription for Lasix, Lasix to get rid of the salt, Chinese to give the salt. <laughs> so, so there's a 10% is medical, 40% is choice, and 40% is poverty or wealth or uh, I'll call it station in life. So Mike, this kind of leads us into social determinants just a little bit. Do you yes. want to jump into this a little bit and talk about this? Yes, this, I'm, boy, I'm happy I'm here. This is a great conversation. I think we're at the point in the United States where we can't out doctor chronic disease. We as doctors and nurse practitioners and PAs cannot run fast enough to keep up with the groundswell of chronic disease that's coming towards us through diabetes and obesity and depression. Um, we need to go upstream of that and look at how we're living as a community. We Any talked comments? A, yeah, we talked a little earlier we on talked some of this a little too. bit earlier too that there's lots of things communities have that are uh, th that can help us. Putting in the lake walk in Duluth, Jerry Kimball was was a mastermind at getting that to be a place where we can walk. And simple walking, for example, access to walking, the, something where it's made easy to do, is really quite helpful. We know that folks who have animals, particularly dogs, have a better health outcome than those who don't. We think it's because they walk more. <laughs> so are you guys gonna talk to me about prevention or anything when I'm there? Jeff? A lot, a lot, yeah, doing a lot of primary care. Um, a large part of our visit is, is gonna be on prevention. Um, and like Dr. Boyce alluded to, a lot of prevention is lifestyle. Um, exercise, diet, cancer screening, immunizations, things that can help prevent illness. So I have my two drinks a day? It's fine. Depends on how big they are. <laughs> Smoking? No. Don't recommend it at all. Okay. Mike, anything else that you throw in for prevention? Yeah, it's a prevention? really it's a really good um, it's a really good discussion. Uh, the things that I would uh, first of all I agree with Jeff around the the immunizations and and the lifestyle factors. I really think that's important. Mm -hmm. And the walking that Mark has mentioned. 
Uh, one thing I might mention for elders is um, depression screening, because uh, it's so miserable to be in the 11th hour of depression and, and live with that mm -hmm. amount of misery. So we like to destigmatize the diagnosis of depression and allow it to, to breathe in the room and talk about it. Um, the other, so depression's one thing. The other thing is um, fall risk reduction. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I mention that is that we run a, a low income program. And um, what I've noticed is that folks that enter the low income program have had a medical event that has caused them to lose their financial resources. And the medical event that usually happens for these folks is a fall with an injury. And to me, it's, I, it's sad because you, you <coughs> see the person had been living a life that was satisfying to them, and then it was uh, changed by a fall, which of course caused pain and injury, but then also poverty and maybe even a decreased functional status. So back to the question about prevention, I would say um, a fall. So you want to stay strong, you want to practice your balance and your stance every day, and just keep investing in yourself. So like those people in San Francisco Bay, the, the, and I shouldn't say those people, but the Asian Americans yes. and others that are doing tai the chi. Tai Chi. Tai Chi, yep. uh, yeah. The balance programs right. that they do. The exercise elders. your body and then exercise your mind. Just kind of yes. keep investing in yourself every day. So you led into the, one of the questions, of course, and that is this person's wondering how mental health concerns can be addressed best in a geriatric patient or population. And I open it up for whoever wants to move in on that one. Medications can help to a degree. I think that medications, in my own viewpoint, medications can help about 30%. So that, that pushes that depression a little bit, uh, and I'll use depression as the model, um, pushes it uh, so that it's not as severe. I think those who surround us probably are another 30%. They're at least as strong as medicine, maybe more. And so we know that people who are in community, whether it be church, the Elks, the VF, a dancing group, a book group, that those folks do better. And part of that is I think they're quite supported. And then I think the other 30% is diet and exercise. We know that exercise stimulates that same hormone that my medication is trying to uh, stimulate. And we think that diet can do that too. There is some suggestion now that deep meditation, whether it be prayerful meditation or mindfulness meditation, also is helpful in that regards. And so that's another whole area that's being explored. And I think uh, research will help us understand that that too is helpful. Crossword puzzles? Exercises the mind. Exercises the mind. Ray, if I might just say one other thing about the depression oh, is that, ahead. Um, um, you know, depression is very common as we age, but one of the things is that it's not something that's talked about. And I've learned that you know, doing a lot of primary care is that a lot of patients won't volunteer that unless you ask. And um, we've now started implementing sc depression screening into our office because it's kind of a standard with everybody. And so in primary care, if you don't ask, a lot of times you won't tell. And as Dr. Boyce said, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why uh, um, depression can be common in the elderly. Number one is um, oftentimes there's a lot of losses, um, loss of independence, loss of family members, loss of social interactions. Then you throw, you couple with that the chronic diseases that patients have to deal with um, um, a lot. And so we've made it a habit to, to ask about those things. And as like Dr. Boyce said, it's treatable. But if we don't ask and, and talk about it, we can't treat it. When I look back to my grandparents, family was close. Mm -hmm. You know, the furthest people really lived away was maybe 30 miles, and everybody was in that area. Now, I'm a mature. You guys are boomers, or I don't know where you, you guys are young. So, I'm a, no, I'm a boomer, too. So, yeah. yeah, so where are your families, and, and how important is that family piece as far as mental health and physical health? Mm -hmm. And how do we, and that's where, Mark, the things that you bring up really come in and, and become you, part of that. If you don't have family, you can s just certainly substitute church or other mm -hmm. social okay. in, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, events or uh, social groups. So I got one other question before I move on. When I, so I'm in there visiting with you. 
Personally, I like to talk one-on-one -on -one with patients. There's a point, though, with elders where you, it's nice to have someone else there also. Mm -hmm. How do you handle that in your offices? Do you see people generally one-on-one, -on -one, a patient and yourself, or do you have any criteria that you go by? Mm -hmm. Or if family's there, they're welcome in. How do you handle those things? And there's the HIPAA and all these other things that get into that. I guess I can say in my own practice, I, um, um, it you know, a lot of it depends on what they're in for. Um, if there's issues that are more medically related, I really appreciate the collateral information that I can get from families. But quite frankly, I prefer to see the patients alone, um, it's pro providing that they're mentally, they have the mental capacity to, to communicate effectively. Because I think sometimes patients won't tell you things in front of family members that they will if you're alone. The reverse of that is that if there's some issues going on, it's nice having the family member there because sometimes they will tell you things that the patient won't. Um, but in general, I prefer to see the patient alone. Well, as you're, as you're working through with end of life and all the other things that you're going to talk about, mm -hmm. there's a, if you have someone else in the room, there's a, there's a certain pressure that you're going to respond in a certain way. Yes. And yes, dad, we want you around forever. And maybe dad has got different ideas or mom. Mm -hmm. So it's probably good to be able to, I, I, I'm like you, I like to, I don't know how you two, you guys can jump into this. I like to talk one-on-one, -on -one, at least mm -hmm. initially. Yep. Mike? Yeah, get it started, and then uh, when there's a point in time where the thought occurs to you, like, well, maybe uh, we could expand the conversation, I usually ask my patient, um, how do you, f you know, I notice that your daughter uh, comes by twice a week, you know, how do you feel about me sharing this information with her? Do you think it would help if I called her? or if she were to be here next time I stop by, you know, um, and just see what happens after I ask the question. I don't know, Mark, what do you think? Yeah, I, I say I run to the family. Yeah. They're a really good source of yeah. information mm -hmm. and oftentimes support. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but it is important that we get the permission to do that. Mm -hmm. I have also seen where it's maybe, um, especially in depression, where, uh, where an older man might be really apathetic by that I mean they've lost interest. They don't go to back to deer camp. They aren't going out to the shop. They don't do the fix-it stuff. And uh, that's really helpful to sit down with that person, sometimes one-on-one, -on -one, but then come around to the family and say, hey, I think this is depression. It looks like they're, it, it, it doesn't really look like they're sad, but they're just not engaging. And so uh, we can sometimes cue families mm -hmm. to watch for symptoms and then pull them in. Th and we might need to see them back and, mm -hmm. and uh, go through that again at a later time. So, so I'm going to open it up and give you one to chew on. This is a, one of those, a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's a full plate. Mm -hmm. Differences between dementia, Alzheimer's, Lewy bodies, and Korsakoff's encephalopathy. And whoever wants to start in or wherever you want to go, there's a lot there for all three mm -hmm. of you. Well, I'll start because I, think the, I was kind of looking your The way. other two can follow up with the real facts and details. I'll just take the easy part. There you go. Hey, you know, just let's call. Let's just start off by saying cognitive dysfunction or cognitive decline, where how you normally have have thought processes as an adult are changing as you become an older adult. And to me. I'm just a mere human being, really, when it's all said and done. I just sort of look at somebody's lifespan, and I say, you know, the brain is a certain way when you're one-year-old, and when you're three-year-old, and when you're 12. And then as you get older, sure, maybe you can't do arithmetic as quickly as you could when you were 20, but some of these older folks are pretty quick to the point, and they're about as honest as they've ever been in their whole life. And so there's some gifts that come in older age um, with the way our brains change. So I, I kind of look at it that way. But in terms of cognitive dysfunction and the term dementia, there's just different categories of dementia. And the categories are generally because they're trying to explain how the dementia occurred or what disease process led to that type of dementia. And so um, you can differentiate them by the, the mechanism, like was it a, a vascular event or a series of small vascular events, like little mini strokes, or is it um, due to you know a you know, what you can diagnose at the time of death with, a, with an autopsy where you can see a buildup of plaque and fibrils, um, sort of junk getting in the way of the normal firings of the neurons. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Korsakoff's, I think, was mentioned that's uh, normally due to 
uh, too much alcohol. We're, um, we had the question from our host earlier this evening about two drinks. Um, that's fine as long as it's one shot of liquor or four ounces of wine or eight ounces of, 12 ounces of beer. But that's for boys, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. That's right. That's for boys, and, and it's not for it's not for women because that's not a tolerance for women. But you can find cognitive changes when you go over that um, due to alcohol. So those are the different categories, and each category has different ways uh, that affect the people that have them. So now I'm right at the end of my knowledge, so I'm going to pass <laughs> it on to these people. I well, think it's important to re recognize that we all have learned to think differently, different cultures also differently. So our ability to make that leap of diagnosis is pretty important on mm -hmm. where they were historically. How is this uh, mental change or cognitive change affecting how they're doing now? So uh, I, I see a lot of women who are really good bookkeepers who can't do math anymore, and I know that they've had cognitive change. Mm -hmm. I see a guy who used to be able to fix an engine hardly be able to lift the hood, and I know that there's cognitive mm -hmm. change. Ray, one of the common things that we get in, you know, in primary care is uh, patients come in all the time, they're afraid they're getting dementia. And you know, where's that line between the normal memory loss that we get as we age versus dementia? And that's a, and that's a concern so with a lot it? of patients. And there is a difference, and so that's where we start asking a lot of questions. And um, you know, dementia, in my mind, is is more of it's it's a it's a basket term, but it usually is caused by something. And the question is, where is the normal you know where is the normal age related cognitive loss versus dementia? That's why we ask some very certain questions. As we age, some short term memory um, loss is is almost uh, universal. I'm you know remembering names, remembering faces. But there's certain things in dementia that you can tease out the short term. Somebody may be able to tell you exactly what happened in 1943, but can't remember what they had for lunch. And so we'll ask a lot of questions that. Most commonly when patients ask me that, I will have to say though, it's more age-related cognitive decline than true dementia yeah. when, you, when you ask the right questions. Yeah. Vitamins. We're running out of time. So first of all, diet and vitamins. Uh, there's a lot of discussion, too much calcium, how much calcium, does, th does calcium cause problems with uh, calcification in the blood vessels? Are there vitamins that you should take? What kind of a diet should a geriatric person have? Should they have supplements? And short answers, guys. Fruits and vegetables. Yes, sir. That's it. Throw the pills Enough away. Enough said. Mm -hmm. And that's not a, that expensive. Uh, and we're doing pretty good on food desert problems in our social determinants. I'm on the Iron Range. Where can I go? Where should I live? Where does an Iron Ranger go to get care uh, for geriatrics? And you know, it, most of, up on the range, most of our geriatric care is provided by primary care physicians. Mike, how old should I? How old of a person should come to see you from a geriatric standpoint? Uh, what what age is geriatric? Oh, that's a that's. A good you haven't question. gotten there yet, so you're going to think about yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> I, think, I like to joke because you know I'm in the grocery store and somebody says, "Hey, I should come see you," and I always say, "Hey, why don't you wait 20 years? You're you're not there yet." You know, <laughs> I would say it's more functional uh, status. You know, uh, late 70s with functional impairment, or then if you're doing functionally well into the 80s. What are this person's asking? What are good bone building programs? Number one is exercise. Yes. Weightlifting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Agree. Calcium. That's kind of getting debunked a little bit, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. I would agree. So is the vitamin D. The vitamin D. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Resistance training. Yes, mm -hmm. all of those. And short-term resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's see. Ketogenic diets. We've already debunked all the diets. You want to talk about You don't want to talk about that. All right. Fruits and vegetables. Fruit. <laughs> and olive oil. And olive oil. oil. Fruits, Thank vegetables, you. and olive oil. <laughs> so I'm getting more crotchety as I get older, and I don't want to take my medicines anymore. You need to see a palliative care specialist. <laughs> <laughs> End of life is coming. You're going to tell my kids that? Mm -hmm. I could. They're, they're going to want me to hang on for whatever reason. Yeah, but it's you. Mm -hmm. It's not their choice, it's your choice. Exactly. I hope that was heard, because that's a really, really important point. Mm -hmm. That really is an important point. Huge. And as children, we 
really want to try to help our parents and we want them to be around for a long time, but it's parent choices. Mm -hmm. Went through that with my own. That's, that's really, really a strong point. Um, I would say, uh, Ray, if I could. Oh, um, please do. The one discrimination that is still tolerated in our society, society is ageism. You know, we've, we've been pretty hard on racism and pretty hard on gender orientation and um, all that. But ageism seems to be very well accepted and tolerated. Um, so maybe uh, people might help themselves by being more aware of the discrimination that they hold against people that are older. One thing we didn't talk about tonight is transportation. Ricky Puma and I used to, well, Ricky is the one that came up with it, but the, the, the uh, circle bus in Carlton County. Thank you very much for watching tonight. This has been a great discussion. I want to thank our panelists, Dr. Mark Boyce, Dr. Jeff Copeman, Dr. Michael Van Scoy, and our medical student volunteers, Michael Bergdorf, Nick Reiners, and Erica Swenson. Please join me next week for our last program of the season on heart problems and high blood pressure. My panelists will be Dr. Anna Mona, Angel, Dr. Kalkedon Bishu, and Dr. Emily Onello. Thank you very much for watching and have a great night. Enjoy the snow.